Good morning. It's uh, good to be here. I decided to come down out of the clouds to talk with you folks. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, you also notice here uh, we in, our, our new headquarters is actually in Tucson where there's no sun. But since we're a cloud computing company, I had to wait many days to get a cloudy day and take a picture of our building there. So anyways, enough on that. But um, I wasn't sure what to title of this because I'm really going to talk about HPC. As most of you know, I have a, a, a strong HPC background during the Petascale days. That pushed about 10 years ago, so that's starting to date me a little bit. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the cloud. I'm going to talk about the missing middle. Um, and also um, the small and medium-sized companies. And I'm going to present it in the context of the experience of the journey that Nimbus has had in our path of moving toward that direction. And some of the pitfalls and some of the lessons we've learned and some places we actually had to pivot in order to uh, move forward. So my question, how many of you remember these surveys? They were done about 10 years or so ago. They were done by IDC. They were funded in part by um, uh, DARPA. And Susie Tishner was an active part of that. I'm not sure if she's in the audience right now. But I don't know, know she's here. Um, her, card, her card's here. But she was involved in by, at the Council of Competitiveness. And if you look at that, it really appears as if there is a potential business opportunity there. Um, it states that um, if you lower the barriers, and there are a number of firms that are willing to pay for consulting, they're willing to access software via the internet, and they're willing to pay, put up some cash, 2K, 2K to 10K a month. So is that real or not? That's the question. Uh, so in 2008, which is uh, shortly thereafter the uh, that market survey, and it's actually there was more than a dozen or so different surveys and pilots and activities over that time, big portion, missing middle, and uh, looking at how to move small and medium-sized companies forward into modeling and simulation. But so uh, Brian Schott and I started the company in 2008. So the missing middle here is really composed of your desktop only users, your entry users, and your uh, users that are starting to use the larger scale uh, computing systems. And the L is, is emphasizing the missing middle aspect. And one of the cre key questions are, there appears to be a motivation there, a desire. Uh, the question is, what's the adoption rate of those users? And what's the time to adoption? And is it possible for a unsubsidized business to make money in that area? That that's the question. And for example, Nimbic's uh, last IDC forum presented uh, a nice talk on the missing metal. Their focus primarily is in in this area here, but that's a small segment of uh, of the market to a certain extent. Because uh, if you look at the total size in the market there's 33%, approximately a third, that are what I call never-nevers, that are probably never going to ever use modeling simulation. There are those that are uh, focused on, that are domain experts, that, and especially in manufacturing area, that um, have potential of using apps, like the apps that are be developed under the Olson Project at Ohio Supercomputing Center. And then there's another third that are currently using modeling simulation as a desktop and would like to move forward. And there's a number of different companies that are focused on serving that market, and they're doing relatively well with that market. But it, it's, a, it's a subset. Now, on the left-hand side is an old DOE slide. It was developed during the Petascale days that talked about we really want to move people from the physical prototyping over to simulation. And so what's this mean for the missing middle? A lot of the missing middle are on the left-hand side, and when they get to the right-hand side, 
they are doing some small, uh, possibly, hopefully, virtual prototyping and so forth. But a lot of times they need to do it in the context of a larger system. If you're talking about OEMs, they really want to do modeling of systems of systems eventually. So what that means, you have multiple players with different models, different databases, libraries, and so forth. You really need to integrate together in order to move forward and use HPC. And so on the far right-hand side, the diagram that shows you really need to connect the expertise, computing, and the user together. And that was the initial focus of Nimbus was to connect uh, single users with their application, with expertise, and move forward. But what we're finding is that there is much stronger market motivation for collaborative computing, regardless if it's on the cloud or HPC. So here's the, the timeline of the uh, where we have gone, and this has been driven by the market. We started out with uh, lower computing for missing middle. Most of the early systems were based on a uh, brokery type interface to a number of HPC systems. We have migrated away from those, partially because it's so hard to interface HPC systems, and they keep changing their interfaces all the time. So it's too much of a um, expense to keep up with all those, in other words. Uh, so we really migrated to the cloud for that reason, and a lot of users uh, uh, do not quite need the, the, the full capability of HPC at this time. And we moved into lowering the barriers of, for um, small communities of interest, and we really wanted to accelerate um, that. And I'll give you some examples within the DoD for microelectronics design aspect, where the ability to design chips across multiple sites Mobile organizations uh, is very, very important. Um, next, uh, we found that once you have a lot of users using a shared environment, uh, libraries, marketplace, repositories, then you get into the need for workflows that you can reuse across users. And eventually, today, we are getting real traction and the data analytics across the manufacturing supply chain. The ability to track your product or your yogurt, for example, what if you as a marketing person could, uh, could have the capability to, to put a tag, uh, ID tag on, uh, on each yogurt cup so a consumer could go and actually see what cow it came from out in the farm. Likewise, from a, a um, uh, federal regulations uh, perspective, the ability to track the origin of all your food products uh, is very, very important if in case you ever have to do a recall. Um, so he here's the resulting timeline of the products that we have developed at, at Nimbus based upon the market. And so initially we started down here in the marketplace based on HPC focus, uh, providing a brokerage interface to the um, HPC systems. Um, we then migrated to the cloud with a uh, secure collaborative cloud framework. Our initial focus was the DoD. And all of our collaborative frameworks have a marketplace embedded within them. So users can move their desktops, what software, uh, IP uh, libraries that they need. Um, we then added workflows, became uh, uh, value-added reseller for a number of different software packages, and eventually in 2016, we extended it into the, um, the supply chain domain. Um, and so, and now we're primarily cloud-focused, but there is a uh, a thought I'm going to leave you with at the end about maybe where HPC fits in. This is an example of where we were with our marketplace, essentially e-commerce marketplace. We get, get access to different software packages, remote desktops, um, and go through your uh, 
click-through agreements, et cetera, in other words, to get access. For example, in the bottom is Abagus. Um, we became a, a, um, a VAR for Simulia, and, and also our, our e-commerce marketplace, we're willing to rebrand, uh, offer to the general public, and uh, they can, uh, we can work with them, the companies, to rebrand it. And this is an example of an awesome brand, uh, branded website that is based uh, in Ohio, and it's actually funded by the state of Ohio. And we actually now have 16 different apps hosted on that awesome website. Uh, so uh, we are willing to offer our e-commerce website uh, in, in a rebranded form. Now I'd like to move over to collaborative type platforms. This is one for the DOD, and there is a real desire within the DOD to essentially be able to um, do chip design across multiple organizations, laboratories. They also need a big need to uh, work between the primes and the subs, and also the government that's actually doing the verification of, of the chip designs. Now what they're doing is shipping files back and forth, and it's a nightmare. Different software versions, you name it, uh, it, it it's a real, real nightmare. And the other thing is, um, there's no one laboratory really now has a critical mass to do entire chip design anymore. So you have to collaborate in order to move forward. Um, so we have uh, developed a, a, uh, a platform that allows designers to go through their normal chip design process, but within a secure environment. It's hosted on the Amazon Gov Cloud, and um, we are in the final process of getting an authority to operate for this cloud. So it'll be a DOD certified type of uh, collaborative cloud uh, platform on the cloud. We also support OpenStack in addition, so that if you need a classified or a private version, we can host it the same envir environment on, on uh, uh, OpenStack type platform. And you can see the marketplace is sort of implied there, the meter, meter billing, uh, access to different uh, EDA software tools is all part of the marketplace. And right now we have a five-year IDIQ contract in place so different services can get access to this and can fund this and host their projects on this. So what does this really look like? Uh, and, and I'll cover that in two slides. So this talk a little bit, a bit about security. So, Amazon GovCloud has gone through all the FedRAMP process, all the certifications, and it's a painful process. In order to get an ATO authority to operate, you need to uh, get your application layer and framework certified. And so we have gone through and, and done that, and we have uh, hardened the virtual machines uh, images. We have applied uh, the STIGs. Uh, we've, on the bottom part, we've implemented a number of different monitoring techniques, including Amazon GovCloud's monitoring techniques, plus the ones from um, Nexus uh, Cloud to uh, do this. And we also support two-factor authentication. So our approach is for both our DoD products and our commercial products is to offer DoD-level security for all of our products, because it's much easier. And uh, we have automated to a point where it's very easy to do that. So th this is what it looks like. You have this nebulous cloud here, uh, and this is on Amazon Gov Cloud, and you can spin up enclaves, essentially project areas. And so the green here represents a, a project area here, and within there you can specify uh, who has access to what tools, what libraries, uh, PDKs, etc. So we have very fine granularity of who has access within an enclave, and also be between enclaves or projects, they can also get access to different um, items from the repository also. So we have very fine granularity of who can get access to what, and we can also meter very easily who's using what software also. Also, from a security perspective, the fact that we have very fine granularity, uh, due, in part, due in part to the capability within the, the GovCloud, 
is that we can monitor what anyone is doing. So we can have complete history of who moved the data, when, where, and how, in other words. And so that is all. And the ability to spin up virtual machines is very easy to take them down. Um, and so that's the approach. The other thing is exciting is that, um, is that universities can also work within the same environment, but they only get access to certain things. And one of the biggest problems with academic research is getting access to any real data. And that's something I'll talk a little bit more about, the smart manufacturing cloud. Now I'm going to move to the application of a collaborative platform to a department project. And the goal was to energy reduction. It's energy reduction through the ability to add sensors to, for example, with Praxair to a steam methane reformer furnace, which has uh, 96 burners. And, and in the past, it's sort of like a black box. So it was instrumented. Um, and then the information was then uh, fed into the cloud um, along with a bunch of other uh, um, data. Uh, models were developed, and the goal is to eventually replicate this across multiple sites, which is why the cloud is, is attractive. Um, there is an HPC-like component of this. There is a high-resolution CFD model that runs, that runs for actually a couple days, uh, developing high-fidelity models for that. Uh, so there is a need for HPC in that particular space. And General Dynamics is more of a discrete uh, line process where you want to be able to track the, a, uh, uh, a product uh, through the entire cycle, through the different uh, uh, processes, through the furnace and annealing and machining process. And there again, you want to do it across multiple plants at some time. And this is what it looks like in the cloud then. You have your enclaves, the Praxair, General Dynamics, totally isolated. They get access to common workflows, uh, resources in the marketplace. And then you have the, the university component on the top part where you actually are having the models and workflows being developed. And this particular case, for this pilot, we use the Kepler workflow. We adopted that for, for the cloud uh, for this. So it allows multiple people to get access to this. And what's different from this collaborative platform compared to the chip design, in the chip design, you want to ha essentially have no data coming in. The only data going in and out of the cloud is the pixel data to your screen. Here, in this case here, you have real-time data flowing between the plants and, and the cloud. And this is another slide to just emphasize the fact that uh, there's a, a large amount of reuse that's possible uh, with the various uh, uh, models, um, configurations uh, that are developed within the marketplace of, among different uh, projects. And this is an eye chart, but essentially what this shows is this runs on OpenStack, this could run on Azure. We've, we've looked at that. It's, it's not a major jump to support Azure at this time. It also runs on Amazon. And the, the framework, or wireframe as we're calling it, is essentially this gray part around here that allows us to insulate it from the different clouds and from the marketplace and the various vendors' products. And so from user to user, the only thing they have to do is add the portion in the blue, which is the workflow component. And they extract the, the software applications from the marketplace, be able to set up the organizations, set up the data flows, and proceed from there. So there's a high um, degree of reuse. So the, the, this led to, um, this was a, at least a, a, a precursor to us uh, winning, we being the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition, winning uh, the Clean Energy Smart Manufacturing Innovation Institute. That was announced in June 22nd. It's a five-year, uh, $75 million government share of funds with about 2x worth of uh, 
industry funds. And there is a network of about 100 companies involved in here. All your, most of your major companies, Alcos, the Corning, the General Mills, the Praxair, General Dynamics, et cetera, along with a, a fair number of academic and laboratories are part of this activity. And this is a little different than most of the other institutes in the fact that this is less focused on technology and more on applying it and, and, and really integrating the supply chain together and all the sensors together. So this is really out to shoot, ready to go, in other words. Um, it's headquartered in LA. Uh, Jim Davis is the CTO of that. And there are four regions, in the Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, and Gulf Coast. And unlike a lot of the other inst institutes, uh, the con control and outreach is really localized to these regions. So you can join this by joining one of the regions, or you can join at, at the so-called corporate level or at the, at the headquarters level, depending upon how far your, your company reaches. Um, so we're quite, uh, quite excited about that. And the one thing I want to highlight that reaches back to Missing Middle, it's all inclusive, small, medium, and large companies. And it's very important it's all inclusive because it has to include the supply chain. Um, and one of the things we're learning that you can try to make an impact in getting small, medium-sized companies on board uh, through the product design phase, that takes forever to do that. Um, the, the time to adoption is just too long. A better way is to come in through the back end, through the production side, because that impacts their bottom line immediately. So if their, their customer says, we want you to get integrated in the cloud and start doing these data analytics, they're going to do that because that's going to impact their, their bottom line, the revenue in the next month or two, or six months, in other words. If you go in the product design phase, it's going to be two, three years, and most of them are just lucky to, are just trying to survive that long. So it's sort of an interesting way of coming in the back door to engage small and medium-sized companies or a missing middle through the supply chain dimension and where you provide a, a turnkey process. So um, enough on that soapbox. Uh, this is what it looks like, um, what Sesame Smart Manufacturing Platform looks like. And um, down in the bottom there, you have your, uh, mainly the automation tools that are being supplied by the major uh, automation vendors. Um, OSIs, the Savagents, uh, you name it, in other words, they're all supplying a lot of those, and a lot of the major plants companies have those facilities in place. As you migrate further out in the supply chain, the amount of automation they have on board today becomes less, and so the goal of smart manufacturing platform infrastructure is to essentially integrate and get data fed from all these different degrees of automation across the, the supply chain. And down to the, actually the Internet of Things with a lot of smaller companies will be implementing. And that will be fed into the cloud and that will allow them to do the analysis uh, that's indicated on the right-hand side. And it, it really supports uh, across multiple um, uh, domains here. You can see the paper, steel, metals, et cetera, in other words. The other thing I want to point out is that there need, there's also a need for a hybrid approach. There is a need for a private implementations of this within local companies, because some f companies say, this data I'm never going to put in the cloud. I don't care. And so they want a private. So, the, so we have the ability to support both private and, and uh, so-called uh, Sesame uh, cloud implementations. And I should note, in other words, is that within the Sesame environment, there will be a large number of contributors to this platform to grow it. So it will be sort of open source within th th this community. And since I'm running out of time here, um, this is uh, sort of the value proposition. And the important thing is, is that there's almost zero startup time with this type of a pr process. You have a ready-to-use platform. You can go right in to start trying doing system integration across your workflow, across your supply chain. Uh, you can go through a different type of, of adaptive test board beds. Uh, you can try modeling. 
You can train your workforce. And most important, we are applying essentially DOD type level security to this platform by, by default. And in order for a small company like Nimbus to be able to support this, we have made a major emphasis in write a code, test routines, develop to test it automatically. We uh, do essentially continuous integration testing, uh, build up of virtual machines for all the different software packages is absolutely mandatory. Um, and so we've really automated this. We've embedded security into this. So we try to remove the human element from this as much as possible to maintain uh, um, security. And the other thing is we could not have gotten even close to where we are today without leveraging OpenStack. There is a wealth of OpenStack software available in the cloud community that's not available in the HPC community for companies like my, myself to use. And our, our website, for example, we um, have re redone three times already. We started out with Java. That, that world in the web area is changing so, so amazingly that it, um, that we ha now have about 10 times the capability we originally had and about the 10th amount of time to do it because we're now programming at a very high level, so to speak, leveraging various open stack sources of software to do what we're doing. So this is almost my last slide here. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about HPC. I've talked a lot about cloud. The question is, where do we go in the future? And since I have uh, a split personality here, so I've come from the HPC background, I've been in the cloud, and the question is, where do we go from here? And from my personal perspective is, we really need to move toward a cloudy HPC. And I did a, 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 a Google search on that, and in most cases, when talking about cloudy HPC, it's moving HPC tools to the cloud. What I'm suggesting, we move the cloud to an HPC. Have a cloud front end so you can take advantage of all the open source software, all the software applications out there, so you can host them much more quickly on your HPC platform. Because what we're seeing, there's a need for workflows that have both, don't necessarily need HPC, but also need bare metal applications running on the machine. So if you have a workflow that could support both and, and present a cloudy environment to the user, it sure would make life a lot easier for a lot of people. And for example, our collaborative platform then could be hosted on your HPC system, uh, open it up to a lot more people. So I think it's time for us to, to sort of join forces. It's not either HPC, it's not all cloud. Uh, there's enough of space here and opportunities for everyone. So that's my soapbox for today. And so this is the, so we want to lower the barriers of, of computing for everyone. You cannot lift up the missing middle just by themselves. We've done that. There's no money being made there either. You have to lift everyone up. That's the bottom line from, from a supply chain perspective. Uh, and so that's the approach we're taking. And our new byline is collaborative computing provides the innovation edge. That's where we're, we're going and contact location and our multiple locations that we have. Thank you.